Hare Krishna. Hare. Here we are. <laughs> this is the Avalon Ballroom. And the next band is <laughs> Grateful Dead. <laughs> Please be careful of the psychedelic colors. <laughs> okay. All the color is over there. We're in black and white over here. <laughs> oh, how do you go? Yeah. <laughs> That's your, what's your new name? Maya who? <laughs> <laughs> okay, well, you know, Maya's a pure devotee. <laughs> um, Dober Dosley? Uncle. Thank you. Namma
Hey, hey, hey. 
four verses talking about how one should not worship the demigods, okay? Any questions? Kamai stas tarita jnana Kapadyante na devataha Tam tam niyamam astaya Prakritiyani yata swaha, Prakritiyani yata swaha, Kamaistas na devataha, Tam tam niyamam astaya, Prakritiyani yata swaha, Kamaistas Prapadyante na devataha Prapadyante na devataha Tam tam niyam niyamam astaya Tam tam niyamam astaya Prakritya niyata sva Prakritya niyata sva Desires. Tai Tai. Various. Dritta. Deprived of. Jnana. Knowledge. Prapadyante. Surrender. Anya. To other. Devataha. Demigods. Tum Tum. Corresponding. Niyamam. Regulations. Astaya, following, following. Prakritya, 
by nature, niyata, controlled, swaya, by their own. So Krishna is going to set the stage by giving a series of four verses why one, sh one should not worship the demigods. He explains it in detail. Prabhupada expands on it. Those who in whose intelligence has been stolen by material desires surrender into demigods and follow the particular rules and regulations of worship according to their own natures. Hmm. Purport. Those who are free from all material contamination surrender unto the Supreme Lord and engage in his devotional service. As long as the material contamination is not completely washed off, there are by nature non-devotees. But those who have material desires and who resort to the Supreme Lord are not so much attracted by the external nature because of approaching the right goal, they soon become freed from the material lust. In the Srimad Bhagavatam it is recommended that whether one is a pure devotee and is free from all material desires or is full of material desires or desires liberation from material contamination, he should in all cases surrender to Vasudev, Vasudev and worship him. As stated in Bhagavatam 2 3 Tam, Akama Sarva Kamo Vaha Moksha Kama Udara Deti Rena Bhakti Yogena Yajeta Purusham Param. Less intelligent people who have lost their spiritual sense take shelter of demigods for immediate fulfillment of material desires. Generally, such people do not go to the Supreme Personality of Godhead because they are in the lower modes of nature, that is, ignorance and passion, and therefore they worship various devas. Following the rules and regulars of worship, they are satisfied. The worshippers of demigods are motivated by small desires and do not know how to reach the supreme goal, but a devotee of the Supreme Lord is not misguided. Because in Vedic literature there are recommendations for worshipping different gods for different purposes. For example, a diseased man is recommended to worship the sun. Those who are not devotees of the Lord think that for certain purposes the demigods are better than the Supreme Lord. But a pure devotee knows that the Supreme Lord is this master of all. In the Chaitanya Charitamrita, Adi 5142, it is said, Ekala Ishwa Krishna Asa Sava Vritya. Only the Supreme Personality Krishna is the master and all others are servants. Therefore, a pure devotee never goes to the demigods for satisfaction of material needs. He simply depends on the Supreme Lord and the pure devotee is satisfied with whatever the Lord gives. Om Ajnan Timirandasya Gyanajana Salakaya Chaksutam Militam Yena Tasmai Shri Gurave Namaha Shri Chaitanya Manovistam Stapitam Yena Bhutale Swayam Bhupa Padam Mayam Tadati Swam Padanti Kam Nama Om Vishnu Vadaya Krishna Prasthaya Bhutale Srimakti Bhakti Vedanta Swami Niti Namine Namaste Saraswati Deve Gauravani Pacharine Nirvishesha Sindhya Padi Asyakya Deva Sitarine Jai Sri Krishna Chaitanya Prabhu Nityananda Sri Advaita Gadada Mahir Sivana Siddhi Gaur Bhakta Vrinda Hare Krishna Hare Krishna Krishna Hare 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 Ram Hare Ram So, worship is mentioned throughout the Vedas, and there's different types of worship. And the highest form of all worship is to worship the Supreme Lord. But there are persons who are still interested in using worship in order to satisfy uh, material desires. So, in, you'll find that there are recommendations for such people to worship uh, people who are known as devatas or what they call, these are angas, or limbs of the Supreme Lord, who are in charge of various aspects of the material energy. It's almost like you have your president, and then you have your cabinet members, and you have your political officers, and you have your various types of departments within the government, 
the president is the supreme head and maybe he puts policies and directions into these other government agencies but they carry it out now to use that as an, an example so the supreme lord he is the master of all living entities and he also all the demigods work under his supremacy although they don't always follow his supremacy in terms of the instructions of the lord sometimes they act independent <coughs> because they are also conditioned souls who have desires for material enjoyment but mostly they they heed to the the instructions of the lord but one of their services is to facilitate people who are pious in other words people want material satisfaction material benefits material gain material position and so we find that in the vedas there's recommended ways to worship to get those things which keeps you what they call in the house of veda in other words by following the prescribed rules to fulfill your material desires you're doing it according to the authorized process so that culture and that knowledge is there within the Vedic tradition and people in India understand that. And of course, of course, now India is changing and being influenced by the West. But generally, the Western countries, uh, if they want material desires, they just go for the, the activity itself without any form of giving any acknowledgement to anything other than their own plans. And so therefore, Although both are trying for the same thing, one does it in an authorized way and one does, does it in an unauthorized way. So, but both are trying for the same thing. But, but, but the advantage of doing it in the authorized way is that when you follow these rules and regulations, after a while you start to realize there's something better than what you're trying for. And that could, allows you to eventually understand and Krishna will explain that in the next few verses that beyond the demigods, he is the empowerment for the devas. He gives them their power to give you what you want. In other words, it's by their uh, agency that he empowers them to you know, act the way they do. And so Krishna says, if you're actually intelligent, you just waste time worshiping the demigods, so just worship me. That's basically what he's saying. Because the same thing the demigods give, I give anyway, because they can't give you anything that I, I don't give them. You know? So other, otherwise, so an intelligent person will understand that the, uh, well, why, why worship the demigods? Why, why, why don't worship the Supreme Lord? And not only will I satisfy all my desires, but I'll get the supreme goal of life, which is love of God or devotion to the Supreme and so here, Krishna is starting off his explanation, which will go on for four verses, of why wouldn't one, uh, why, and he uses the word uh, hirita jnana. Jnana means intelligent and rita means damaged, or that intelligence that is not so developed. So those who worship uh, these higher beings for material desires, they're considered to be less intelligent or without proper intelligence like that because uh, material desires are temporary and cannot fulfill the needs of the living entity. One may aspire for something material, but in due course of time, whatever they achieve is lost in the element of time. And material desires fulfilled can also never give complete satisfaction. Sometimes a person will look towards something and try to achieve it, and once they get it, they get something different than what they want. Although they look, they're looking for happiness or satisfaction or some material gain from something, what they get instead is some kind of suffering and misery because that's the nature of the material world. Anything in this world has duality to it. So whether, whether, whatever, there's no such thing as absolute good in this world, because whatever is good has another side to it. And that is what we say, bad or 
undesirable like that. So no one really can fulfill material desires because even if you fulfill them, even if you get what you want, and even if you feel satisfied with what you get, time takes it away. So, And a lot of times people, when they don't get what they want, then they feel unhappy, they lament, and sometimes they become very depressed, suffer from anxiety or depression, or sometimes become suicidal. I was just, one, somebody just sent me an email message today that um, someone they were preaching to online, uh, they, were, they, were, they were busy because of the coronavirus, the whole business has pretty much stopped. And they're losing everything. So they're going into bankruptcy and the family is now, you know, going from uh, luxury to poverty. So the fam, one of the messages I got that one person in the family, I think it was the mother, she said, we were thinking of poisoning the children and then killing ourselves. This is how they were taken to this, you know, economic crunch. This is, yeah, I mean, this is the exact words. They were going to kill the children and then kill themselves by poisoning it. But then, somehow or other, they came in contact with one of my disciples who was doing a Bhagavad Gita study course online. And because of that, they, got, they started reading the Gita. After reading the Gita, they changed their mind. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, when we say Krishna consciousness saves lives, <laughs> in more, more than one way. <laughs> so. So you can see uh, how sometimes people put so much hope in material life that when things reverse uh, and their whole world is turned upside down, just like in America in, in the 1920s, from 1927 to 1929, I think of it. Uh, it's a famous historical part of history. It's called the Great Depression, when the entire economy of the United States collapsed completely. And there was, everybody lost everything. All the banks folded, money was no good anymore. You know, there was nothing. And people were jumping out of windows and committing suicide. And they were killing themselves. This is because they lost that everything material. So if one who lives for something material, and then they lose for what they live for, they think, what is the use of life? And so a devotee lives for something that is not within what is called the tangible, the intangible reality, <laughs> or the, something that doesn't stand the test of time. Because when you practice Krishna consciousness, you, you can't lose, even if you don't finish in this life. Because whatever you do in Krishna consciousness, whatever service you perform, whatever you, consciousness you gain, stays with you. It's, it's eternal. You may not experience that, but it's calculated that way. Just for example, if you become 40% Krishna conscious in this life, and you end your life, in your next life you'll start from 40%. You don't start from zero. Or wherever you leave off, you start 90%, you know, in the same way. But in material life, you know, whatever you have in one life, you could be completely opposite in the next life. You could lose, you could be a king in one life and you could be a dog in the next. <laughs> there was one political leader, I won't mention names, who was a very powerful leader in one very powerful country. And uh, the next life, he, he became a dog in Sweden. Some astrologers um, followed his pattern of life and did some horoscopes. And, said that he was, a, the one rich lady in Sweden had two dogs and one of them was his former king. <laughs> so now instead of barking at the citizens, he's barking at the, you know, his master. Or <laughs> Same thing. The bark is a little different, but it's still a bark. <laughs> so yeah, so this is, this is material life. And material life, it's really ridiculous when you look at it. It's totally absurd. It's manic. It's crazy. It has no sensibility to it. It's for people who are without any brains completely. 
<laughs> Those who suffer empty-headedness, Prabhupada said, you look inside and you don't find brains, you find only cow dung that's always inside. <laughs> And if that's cow dung, that's pretty good. But mostly, <laughs> mostly it's another kind of dung, which we won't talk about. <laughs> because material life is, is you just work so hard to lose everything you work, you get. You know? <laughs> and while you're, trying to, while you're trying to get it, struggle hard to get it, you have to work hard to really be sinful. I mean, really, you have to really work hard to be a materialist or be sinful. And Krishna consciousness is so nice, it's so easy. What do you do? Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare. Hare Ram, Hare Ram, Ram Ram, Hare Hare. Oh, what else? Well, we have some nice food, okay. What else do we do? We dance, oh, okay. And we read books. <laughs> and we make flower garlands. <laughs> We do all kinds of nice stuff. When we look at beautiful forms of the Lord, who is just captivate our the, our sense of beauty. So you know, Krishna consciousness is really simple and sweet. And material life is just you have to really work hard just to suffer. <laughs> That's just what it is. You know, it's just people. You know, Prabhupada says they they drive 50 miles to work one day and. 50 miles to work back the next evening, 100 miles going this way and that way. That's nothing nowadays. I, w I met one man on a train when I was in India, and he, he was living in Pune and working in Bombay. That's a four-hour train ride every day, back in four hours one way. So he said, this is the only job I could find. <laughs> and he said, I, had a, I have a child and I have a wife and then I have to have some more income. This is the only thing. So he's spending eight hours on the train every day. He leaves like really like seven in the morning or even before that. He actually arrives in his workplace at nine and he must leave about five in the morning. And then he leaves his workplace somewhere around four in the afternoon, gets back about eight o'clock. Just enough time to take some uh, prasadam and fall asleep and then get ready for the next train ride. And these, these, this is not an idle thing. This is how a lot of people just go out of their way just to work hard, just, just to get money or some kind of material thing. And so this, this, this type of life, and people pray for that. Well, they think, well, it's not, so, it's not so good on this planet. Maybe it's better on another planet. <laughs> so let me go to the heavenly planets and, and just do the same thing. I can have more sense gratification because the, the sense gratification there is quite different than the sense gratification here. And Prabhupada says, and, you know, uh, the sense gratification here compared to what's on the demigod's level is like, you know, it's just like, well, he used the example. He says, the women on the heavenly planets compared to the women in the earth uh, are much more beautiful. He said, the women on earth look like horses compared to them. Now, a horse is a very beautiful animal. Don't, <laughs> don't get me wrong now. <laughs> This is not a criticism, it's just, a, just just giving a little perspective on the difference of beauty, that's all. <laughs> but if you're in love, everything looks nice anyway. It doesn't matter what she looks like or what he looks like. <laughs> what do they see in each other? I don't know. But I guess it's something. <laughs> anyway, that's called love. <laughs> They say love is blind. <laughs> really blind. <laughs> Sometimes like that. You know, the Buddhists, they really have a good way of describing how you cannot get attached to the physical beauty of the opposite sex. They, have a, they describe what's inside, beside the outside of that covering. All the nice ingredients that makes up the inside of the material body, which it so smells so nice inside there. <laughs> and what is it? Mucus, bile, air, pus, blood, semen, stool, urine. What else? 
so another lot of bones, yeah, and there's other things in there too. Really beautiful stuff. Imagine somebody just comes into it a bag of mucus, bile, air, bones, pus, blood, semen, stool, urine, says, here, here's your lover. <laughs> wow, she looks so nice. In fact, she smells different today. <laughs> so, and then you cover it with a layer of skin and you think, oh, so beautiful. That's called love. <laughs> it's a Christmas joke, but anyway, this is the material world. <laughs> I'm sorry, ladies, if I'm not going, if this is not, this class is generally what we talk about when we're with the brahmacharis, but. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, but you know, it's actually proven. If you look at the skin close under a microscope, you'll see that there's all little, uh, there's, there's these worms that are in the skin. You can't see them. Everybody has these worms. They're tiny and microscopic worms, and they eat the bacteria around the skin to keep the skin fresh. So if you see that under a microscope, this is what you're going to see your beautiful lover look like. It's, uh, she's got all these worms all over her. <laughs> Hare Krishna. <laughs> so this is love. <laughs> <laughs> I love that worm that fell off. Oh. Right. So just to let you know, material life is always a disappointment. <laughs> but then there is something beautiful about each person. That's called the soul. <laughs> and the soul is actually beautiful, which makes the body look really beautiful. Can you imagine a body without a soul? It looks, it's just, there's no life to it, it's dead. Nobody, nobody really says, oh, look at that beautiful dead body. <laughs> but without, without the soul, that's what it is. The soul gives knowledge, it gives illumination, gives, gives strength and clarity to the body. Everything is there because of the soul's presence. Anyway, I just, these are one of these classes that we give once in a while. <laughs> it's called Wake Up to Reality class. <laughs> but anyway, it's, we go on in Krishna consciousness and we know that we're not these bodies, we're not that bag of stool that everybody else is, you know, thinking is different. <laughs> so this is material life, so therefore, Krishna says, those who actually look for material desires, it calls Rita Gyan, not very intelligent, no intelligence there. And then of course Prabhupada's point throughout the purport is that one should worship the Supreme Personality of Godhead, because in there, there is beauty, there is knowledge, there is happiness, there is energy, there is inspiration, every, all the good qualities and all the good characteristics about life are found in Krishna, because Krishna is the source of everything wonderful and good. There's nothing unpleasant or negative about Krishna. So whatever one, everyone is looking for in the material way, if they look for it in Krishna, they can find it. Sometimes we think it's too hard to find it in Krishna, but actually it's not, because the process of finding it in Krishna is really easy, and Krishna makes it easy if we simply adhere to some simple principles. And Krishna reveals himself according to our, what we say, determination. I mean, you'll see people in the material world, they're so determined to succeed. They work so hard and make so many plans and sacrifice a lot of their time to get some position, to get some facility to enjoy. They, I mean, if, if we were to study how the karmis actually, you know, use their energy to achieve what they want to achieve, we look quite lazy compared to them. Really. They're really, I mean, they're serious about their material life. <laughs> That's a fact. <laughs> and so, but what are they getting? They're only getting more disappointment because ultimately we're not these bodies. We're spiritual beings, so 
Because we're spiritual, we can't be happy with anything material. It's just not possible. It's like if you put a fish on the land, you give it a nice, you know, a fish apartment with fish clothes and a fish house. It looks pretty fishy, right? <laughs> <laughs> so you can't really, you know, entertain a, a water animal on land by giving it all the things that land people have. So a spiritual person cannot be happy with anything material. It's just because it's not our nature. Our, our nature is, you know, the same nature as God, and that nature is spiritual. So there's, there's music that's spiritual, there's food that's spiritual, there's philosophy that is spiritual, there's the relationships that are spiritual, there's activities that are spiritual. As we engage in all of these, then we actually, you know, understand, well, why do I have to worry about material life? It's just, you know, it's just a lot of struggle to get something that I'm going to lose anyway. But Krishna consciousness is so nice. So nice. So this is what this verse is saying here. That this, you know, why, you know, try for something, even if it's so nicely described, material happiness. So ultimately, and Krishna will make the point, he, he's not going to leave this topic alone just by saying one verse. He's going to make the point throughout the next, all the way up to verse uh, 23, so the next three verses also. Okay, any questions, comments, criticisms, uh, requests for distract, detracting certain statements I made? <laughs> Anything? Yes, Mataji. Yes, I know the men have the same body that the women have. There's worms on them too. Yeah. <laughs> and it's not just the ladies, it's just both sides. You're right. Thank you for that point. <laughs> okay, next question. <laughs> So you say that when non-devotees are losing something, they are getting depressed and uh, getting some suicidal thoughts? Sometimes. Mm -hmm. yes. And sometimes if it's not suicidal, it's violent. It comes out either way. Yeah, but when devotees are losing something, like one of my friends, they are also de getting depressed. And you can't lose anything in Krishna consciousness. Yes, but how can we help them in this situation? When Tell they're them. thinking Tell about there's suicide. nothing to lose. There's nothing to lose except your false ego. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Prabh Prabhupada, someone said to Prabhupada, Prabhupada, I want to renounce everything. Prabhupada said, you have nothing to renounce. <laughs> <laughs> it doesn't belong to you anyway. I, I walk into the, you know, I walk into uh, Ananta's room and I say, boy, this is my box, this is my chair, this is my desk. You know, and he'll say, hey, what are you doing? This is mine. <laughs> so, you know, just like they have this thing, uh, Columbus discovered America. I mean, America was there. It was people, people were already on it. So he came and he said, I disguised, discovered somebody else's house. <laughs> oh, I didn't know anybody was here. <laughs> That's the only discovery you could make. <laughs> you just you're ignorant. You found out that you were you were just wrong in the first place. So what do we have to renounce? So it's just a misconception that they're thinking there's nothing to lose because there's nothing to gain. Yeah, but at that moment they don't understand it. Well, because they don't understand doesn't mean it's not right. <laughs> <laughs> I don't understand you, therefore you don't exist. <laughs> it doesn't make sense. You know, well, well, I guess your question is, you know, how to make them understand. Well, we can't really compensate people's loss on the material level, but we can understand that if they practice Krishna consciousness, 
properly, this is the important thing, properly, they will start to feel that, okay, here's something that I can feel satisfied with, I can feel happy with. But the Krishna consciousness is an experience. It's not a theoretical concept that you simply live on. You can't eat your theory. You have to experience the happiness and the knowledge that is available through this process. But if they're not experiencing that, then they will think, oh, you know, I can't do it, or it's not for me. So, yeah. But the, on a devotional level, I mean, what can you lose? A devotee knows that whatever I have is given to me by Krishna. And therefore, I'm using it for his service. And Krishna gives me enough to maintain myself. He gives me food, gives me a place to stay. You know, the basic needs are there. And so, everything's provided by the Lord. And if he decides to take something away, he's just taking back what is his anyway. So, you can't lose Krishna, that's one thing, I mean, that's not, not, not you, you can't lose Krishna. I mean, Krishna is always available, if as much as you want him, he's that much available according to how much you want him. So that is not something that is, you know, a loss if, you know, in the, in the, in the material world, we lose things and we gain things, but in the spiritual world, we can only gain. But people see spiritual life in a material way. And that's the problem. They're thinking in the same way. Because devotees do the similar things that the non-devotees do, it looks the same. But the consciousness is completely different. Does that make sense? Okay. Thank you. Yes, Mataji. Thank you for coming. It's been so many years since I saw you. Yes, the same moment. I came just to see you. <laughs> Good. I came to be here to be seen by you. <laughs> Definitely my, my benefit. And also to see you. <laughs> Something that's connected uh, with um, this point, because we have um, these material connections with our family, mm -hmm. and um, of course it becomes a little bit more obvious to us that we really want to give something more to them because they are our family. Mm -hmm. Maybe we wouldn't have such a need to make other people understand how you know wor how worthy Krishna is and how much it's worthy to approach him, serve him. But with our family, we feel more kind of eager. <laughs> To, so help, to help them? To help them, yeah, to come On a closer. material level, you mean? No, on a spiritual level, too. Oh, that's nice. That's good. If you want to help them on the spiritual level, the question is how to help them. Devotees always find that sometimes that's a problem. How to help them. How to help them, yes, yeah. because they seem um, even more stubborn. Because yeah, the <laughs> resistance for someone. And I've seen, just like I know there's one devotee in Croatia, her father's a real demon. <laughs> <laughs> With a capital D. <laughs> so she's tried everything to do something. And uh, so what, you know, and then she, he knows about prasadam, so he doesn't want to eat prasadam either. So she somehow or other cooks it and offers it on the side without him knowing it. And then she feeds it to him and tells him it's not for shot. I mean, he's getting for shot him anyway. So she's using a little trickery, and somehow or other he's getting for shot him. So, so that's a that's a really severe case of resistance. But one of the things, and this is this is really like consistent, is a devotee practices Krishna consciousness. Their family members benefit also. They also get some benefit, and they can see and feel that benefit. And they also.
also see how their their daughter or their son is actually becoming a nice nicer person. So with parents, family members, a lot of times it's a long-term thing. You just have to be a little patient and go on with your Krishna consciousness. As long as they don't try to stop you. And in America, and this was a big thing in 1970s when Prabhupada's movement really reached the height of you know success, there was this whole movement by a person called Ted Patrick. He was a deprogrammer, and he had organized other people, and they were kidnapping devotees, and then they were trying to deprogram them and taking them into places and torturing them mentally and sometimes even physically to give up their Krishna consciousness. And they were doing it with other spiritual groups too that they consider to be bogus. And uh, so that became a real, I mean, we even went to court for that. And we had a huge court case. Prabhupada became like a lion. And Bajaya Pataka's mother, she formed a group called Parents for Krishna. And there was another group, Parents Against Krishna. <laughs> By other distant devotees' parents. <laughs> so there was two groups like that. So we had a real fight in America. Because America was the first place that Krishna conscious hit in the Western world. And people were thinking, who are these people? They're really strange. They don't sleep enough. <laughs> they were saying, yeah, they were, they were saying, you guys deprived your followers of sleep so you could control them. <laughs> yeah, they were saying that. Sleep deprivation, we were causing, we were getting accused of all things. We went to court a couple of in one court battle, and you know, the devotees simply read from the Shastras. And the judge actually ruled in our favor at the end. In 1977, March 18, 1977, the High Court of the United States, the High Court of the State of New York gave the Hare Krishna movement, ISKCON, an authorized stamp of approval saying this is a bona fide religion, which changed everything around. When Prabhupada read that, he said, now my movement has become successful. So, what we had to go through, I mean, parents were like a big problem. Really. One devotee, he's a sannyasi now, his parents had him kidnapped twice first time they paid $20,000 to have him deprogrammed. He, he escaped and came back. <laughs> the second time they paid 17000 This time they tried to deprogram him and the deprogrammers gave up because they thought this guy is too hard to break. He couldn't, they couldn't break him. That was Bhakti Siddhanta, Bhakti Siddhanta Maharaj. He stays mostly in, uh, in India. I don't know if you know him. But, uh, and the, the programs, the programs were even on television with their shows, with devotees, and we would fight with them on, Ridananda Maharaj had a, an argument, right, on TV with Ted Patrick, and Ted Patrick was so stupid. The guy was a complete moron, that means idiot. <laughs> and uh, he made him, he just, just made him look so bad in public. But, the government was defending these deprogrammers. You know, we we didn't even have a chance legally. We got a, we had to really fight and get special help from special agencies to, about civil liberties and the right to worship. Finally, we won some of the cases, but the government even wasn't supporting us. So this is how bad it was with parents. I mean, parents were really against us. And, Really, it was heavy. Jai Sisi Panchitatva Ki Jai. So, I mean, you can go to that extreme. You know, 
So parents who are using the number, as Prabhupada said, he wrote it in the sixth canto, that um, there's that pastime with Narada Muni and Daksha, you know that story? Where um, Daksha had created 25,000 sons called the Hayashras, and he sent them to a holy place to get purified so he could bring them back and then get them married, and then they would be progenitors to populate the universe. But when they went to the holy place, they met Narada Muni. And Narada Muni preached to them, what are you going to get married for? Stay Brahmachari. <laughs> so, and they all listened to Narada Muni and never came back home. <laughs> so Daksha was angry. So he produced another 25,000 sons called the Salva, Shalavas. And he sent them out to the same holy place. They met Narada Muni. <laughs> he preached to them. They never came back home. <laughs> so now Daksha is really mad at Narada Muni. This time he produced 25,000 girls the next time. So. <laughs> but when he saw Narada Muni, you know, because Narada Muni went to see him because he knew he was angry at him. So he wanted to let him get his anger out. So Narada went just to get to hear his anger so he could get that anger out. So when he saw Narada Muni, he started, you know, saying, you, you know, you're bogus, sadhu. <laughs> he started accusing him of so many things. But then he said, I curse you and you cannot stay in one place for more than three days. So, and Narada Muni was happy with that curse. <laughs> so he could just fly around, you know. So Prabhupada writes in that purport that the parents of my disciples have also cursed me. <laughs> this is Prabhupada. I cannot stay in one place more than three days because of the parents of my disciples. <laughs> yeah, it's in the Bhagavatam. <laughs> and therefore I'm asking my sannyas uh, disciples to take up the curse so I can stay in one place and finish writing Srimad <laughs> Bhagavatam. <laughs> yeah, that's probably, you can read it, it's in the Bhagavatam, it's in the sixth canto. So yeah, this is what Prabhupada had to go through. <laughs> yeah, you, know, the, you know, the people who came to Krishna consciousness were mostly from Jewish or Christian background families, and they didn't understand Krishna consciousness, they just thought we were some demoniac cult that came from the lower regions of existence. You know, we were just strange people. So this is what it was like in the old days. So we had mostly all the parents were against mm -hmm. their, their sons or daughters. And there were so many kidnappings. So many kidnappings. This is, yeah, so now it's not so bad. <laughs> But that's the way it is with, with family members. They don't understand. And sometimes they just don't want to understand. It's just hard. So, so give them some prasadam, be nice to them, but don't listen to them. <laughs> <laughs> Unless they're devotees. <laughs> It's just the way it is. Even Prabhupada, he said, uh, you know, he said, the smarter Brahmins, who else? My God brothers and uh, the parents of my devotees, these are the, <laughs> the main resistance in my movement. <laughs> yeah. Prabhupada has so much resistance. Do you think it was so easy for Prabhupada? Not only did he have to train us, he had to fight against so many external elements that were trying to destroy his movement so many times. Prabhupada was a general. He liked a good fight. When that, that court case came in New York, Prabhupada was like the Shringadev. Oh, you can, if you can hear those lectures, 
They said, they say we are brainwashing. We're saying you don't have any brains to wash. <laughs> we're not brainwashing, we're brain giving. We're giving you brains because you're brainless. <laughs> That's the exact quote. <laughs> yeah, he was like a, he was like a, like, like, a, like the shring day, <laughs> really firing. And he fired up all the devotees with his preaching. And then when they got into court, you know, they were really convinced they had Prabhupada behind it and they spoke so strongly. Because one time, in one court case, somebody showed the judge a picture of Nishringadev and said, this is who they worship. <laughs> and then the judge asked the devotee who was on trial to a comment, and he was trying to make some excuses about trying to describe the Shrinkadev so they could understand. But it wasn't going over. He was just making some weak explanations. So he couldn't explain the Shrinkadev and he couldn't convince the judge either. So, so but Prabhupada said, you get in there and you just tell him, this is our philosophy. The Shrinkadev is our, our worshipful deity. <laughs> so, you know, so we, you know, Prabhupada was like, when he wanted us to speak the truth with surety and not be, what we say, hiding behind some kind of, you know, feelings of inferiority or some, something else. Okay, was it worth your visit tonight? Yes. <laughs> okay. If it wasn't, they still have prasadam afterwards. <laughs> so there's no loss. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Nice to see you again. Hare Krishna. Anything else? Okay, so we can stop here. Thank you very much. Srimad Bhagavad Gita. Ki Jai. Shri Prabhupada. Ki Jai.